Yes, I'm in London and I would like to talk to a person who has been part of the military complex and knows a lot about uh, the infrastructure of chemtrails, but I actually can't talk to her because she's no longer with us, but I can talk to her daughter and she's with me here now. It's Cara St. Louis mm -hmm. from New England, yes. actually, and she's written a book about it, uh, Crosswalks the Sun Sea. And okay, Karen, nice to meet you. Thank and you. Um, nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you. And Camp Trice is for a lot of p persons. It's a question: Is there, is this real or is it um, just a conspiracy theory? And you have been writing a book of fiction, but is it fiction or? It's fictionalized. It's an experience that I actually had, a very personal experience. And when I started the book, I didn't know anything about chemtrails. I will tell you that. I'm just like everyone else. The book began, the story began, my discovery of, of the phenomenon of chemtrails began with really sort of a violent event. My mother um, was killed. My mother uh, worked for the uh, Department of the Navy. She, she was a civilian working for the military for many, many, many years here in London. As a matter of fact, I think... This was probably where she got the closest to working with the scientists who had the most to do with atmospheric physics. Uh, and it started for me on July 11, 2010, which was a beautiful Sunday morning in Maine. Uh, very sunny and lovely. She was doing what she ordinarily would do on a Sunday, which was walking to church. And as she crossed this uh, Main Street, uh, that morning in a very small town with very little traffic and a very small population. She was run down and killed several, she died several hours later in the hospital. You know, it was a very um, jarring event. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly a tragedy in anybody's book. She was only 74. And she was actually almost to the other side of the street when she was killed. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning of the story and that's already um, a lot to deal with. But um, after we, after I dealt with the um, the initial initial shock of her death, um, I just had this sense that something. It was so random, you know, so out of the blue, so it for no sense. reason, it made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And my gut told me that it had something to do. My gut told me it had something to do with her work, mm. which is not really a thought I wanted to entertain. Uh, it's kind of a scary thought, right? Sure. If this little old lady who could barely remember her own social security number wasn't safe, yes, that's a scary thought. So, but I, it just wouldn't go away, this idea that it had something to do with her work. Now, I went through the fall of 2010 just sort of having it like a fly buzzing around my head, bothering me. And then there, was, there were a couple of things that happened um, in the course of events that drove me back to deciding to have to really investigate this. First of all, there was a fellow in the United States, you may have heard of this, called John Wheeler. Mm -hmm. He was an old, kind of in, in his 60s maybe. Mm -hmm. Very well placed, high placed in the military for his entire career, and then had um, a very prestigious career as a liaison between uh, the government and military contractors for many, many years. Well, on December 31st, 2010, they found him in a dumpster. And no one still, I mean, to this day, that really hasn't been investigated. Well, here's this high-ranking civilian working for the military who just dies for no reason. So that started me kind of thinking about it again. But then the next day, birds started falling out of the sky, and fish started washing up on the sea. Do you remember? January 1st, 2011. Uh, these phenomena and where right. masses of animals were dying yeah. and, no, and the most preposterous reasons being yeah. given, yes? Yeah. So, um, when I took all of those things and put them together, I had my mother who was, had a very high security clearance and worked with many operation, um, operation paperclip science, scientists in London who were working on atmospheric physics mm -hmm. for the Navy. That means weapons. Ultimately, because the Navy's not really interested in anything else. Mm -hmm. And um, a phenomenon that nobody could explain. So the thought that, uh, the thought that entered my mind was, did, she, did this poor old woman know something about what had just happened? She, was she going to remember 
wait, I've seen this before, mm -hmm. wait, I've read this before when I was editing the work of these scientists. Okay, so those things drove me to, to take a look at least uh, in, at investigating atmospheric weaponry uh, and those kinds of things. And once you open that, that box, all kinds of things pour out. Yeah. All kinds of scary things pour out. So um, there was one scientist in particular that I knew that she had worked with that was a specialist in atmospheric physics. This was probably January or February of, yeah, January, February, March of 2011. And again, I'm trying to decide between, I, I know I need to investigate this story, I know I need to write this down, and I know bad things may happen if I do, because someone's already been killed. But the very beginning of my investigations, I, someone had tried to run me in, off the road into oncoming traffic. I was driving my mother's car just a couple of weeks oh. after she died. I hadn't even changed the license plates. Yeah. Right. Someone tried to push me into oncoming traffic. Yeah. So, on the one hand, I have this, what, what you might call a very logical investigation into a phenomenon that are linked to my mother to try to understand what happened and why she died. And on the other hand, you have um, events starting to happen to me that uh, accumulate. It's an interesting coincidence, in my opinion, yeah. that my mother was run over on the road and less than two weeks later someone tried to push me into oncoming traffic in places where these things just don't happen. Mm -hmm. right? But if you're a thinking person, you have, to, you have to be skeptical the whole way through and you, know, you have to make the world prove these kinds of things to you. The other thing uh, that was attached to this investigation or to the to my mother's death is I couldn't get any information on her death. And to, to this day, it's been very difficult. Mm -hmm. Why? She was just a little old lady walking to church. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get um, an accident report. I couldn't get anything. I couldn't get anything out of the district attorney. My attorney had to um, solicit the police, the local police department, and remind them that I did have the right to know. Before, I think it was three or four months after she died, I, got, I did get an accident report in the mail, hand addressed with no return address. Hardly official business. Almost like someone had slipped it into an envelope to me, to send it to me. There wasn't a lot in it. But these were the kinds of things that were happening. I couldn't get any information about her death, and I was the sole survivor, and that just doesn't make sense either. Mm -hmm. So you add these things up, and you continue to investigate. Um, and where that led me uh, immediately was geoengineering and chemtrails. That was the phenomenon that it all went to. And I didn't know anything about it at all. So I started to investigate and I started to look for people who were making sense talking about these kinds of things on the radio, very much like what you're doing or what you're trying to do. And I came across one fellow in particular who ended up working with me on the book. His name is Mark McCandlish. Very well, uh, he's like an, encyclopa uh, an encyclopedia mm -hmm. in this area. And so as I came across radio shows where people were trying to explain this to the general population, there was more and more information I get. And I have to tell you that every step along the way, I just got more and more frightened mm -hmm. by what was going on. Yeah. Scared to death. Yeah. And knowing that I had this, this, this thing that had happened that I had to get, really had to get out. It had to get out. That was clear for you. It was very clear for me that yeah. this is coming out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the vehicle. Yeah. And let the chips fall where they may. At the same time, I had um, I have teenage children. Uh, two of them in particular were very ill. My daughter in particular was very ill. And as I started to research the, the manifestations of these chemicals entering our bodies and how they're affecting how we are on the planet, I realized that my daughter was displaying very, uh, very many of these symptoms, yes, of, of toxic metal poisoning. Um, and in fact, I did have her blood tested and there were high levels of arsenic, high levels of cadmium, high levels of lead, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and almost no vitamin D in her body, which was, which is another phenomenon that, that, that goes along with these chemical poisonings. So I realized that my life was completely saturated with this phenomenon, whether I knew it or not, and whether I liked it or not. Yeah. And, and that there was a lot of, some A, someone had died over it, and B, my children were suffering yeah. from it. But then again, here we are, like all human beings, what do we do? How, 
how at risk do we make ourselves? Yes. And um, as I've said to uh, as I've said to people before, the the phenomenon, the thing that happened that really drove me out into the public with this was was the event at Fukushima, because it just sort of added that last card to the top of the pile. And I thought, oh well, you know. You can die. We're all going to anyway. die. Yes. Okay. And we might as well get so. this all out there because otherwise they're just doing whatever they want to us. Yeah. And we have to know what's going on. They're killing us anyway. They're killing us anyway. So let's just talk about it. Let's not make. Let's make this worthwhile. Um, so I did. I continued to write the book. I was very fortunate. I um, I was able to get a lot of help in the technical areas. Things that I didn't necessarily know about. Certainly could not vet them for their authenticity. And um, I worked on the book for about a year and a half. The thing, the thing about the book that I really wanted to have, there were a couple things that I really wanted to have happen. First of all, what I realized studying where we were at with chemtrails was that there was a certain percentage of the population that was already convinced. Mm -hmm. They were convinced by the data. Yeah. All right. It's a fairly small percentage of the population that's convinced by the data. Mm -hmm. Okay, most people, it's way, too, it's really too much of an intrusion on their worldview. Yeah. It's scary for them; they yeah. don't want to let of go course. of it. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So I realized that I had a story mm -hmm. that I could tell that represented someone like me. If I can understand it, if I can find these things out, anybody can understand it, and if I can learn to live with it, we can all learn to live with it and deal with it. Yes. Yeah. So, human beings are entities that respond to story. They're entities that respond to uh, things that you tell them that they can resonate with in their ordinary lives. And I felt like the book was something that could help them do that. And I also knew that all you need is one string to pull. You pull one string and the whole thing can come down very easily. So just, you know, it can be counterproductive to hit people in the face with too much data. They just shut down and they don't want to do it anymore. The other thing that I was really mindful about when I was writing the book is I did not want to present. I did not want to present a story that there was no end to. There were no. There was no solution to. Yeah. Because that's another thing that makes people shut down. Yeah. If there's a, if it seems insoluble, they just. What's the point? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I had this sort of dream, wish, vision, belief. Uh, ultimately, it's the humanity that's involved in the situation that's going to stop it. Yeah. People will argue with me about this. I envision a, a solution that involves the pilots themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I have to believe that ultimately, at least one pilot it has enough goodness or bravery or perhaps just gets so sick of what he's doing, he or she is doing, that they take it upon themselves to flush it out, bring it out into the open. I really think that's the Achilles heel of the whole program. Oh, okay, could, so you're mentioning some pilots now. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what's happening, what's going on in, in the airlines? Is, is it military um, airlines or is it uh, commercial airlines well, too? Uh, yeah. And how does it work? There's a lot of data out there. And I don't know... There's a lot of data out there that suggests that there are bases that are specifically um, bent toward this aim. There are many in the United States, I'm not really sure about Europe, but there are many in the United States where unmarked planes are specifically being used for this sort of uh, event. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that everything that's flying commercially is also being used for this and I, my reading suggests that some airlines know about it, some airlines don't know about it. I was privy to a communication that was given to Clifford Carnicom, who is a very um, dedicated researcher in the United States, um, located in, in New Mexico. Someone who identified himself as a mechanic for one of the larger airlines sent him um, information that suggested uh, the means by which some of these chemicals may be being delivered to the major airlines without anyone's necessarily anyone's knowledge. So I did include that in the book because I think it's important. One of the things that happens is people don't, people can't conceive of how these things could possibly be happening. Well, 
uh, this airline mechanic was brave enough to say, here's what I think happened because I observed it. There are extra systems on the plane in the waste disposal areas, and um, the trucks that are supposed to come in and unload the waste from the airplanes are actually bringing in chemicals. And yeah, that's nobody wants to deal with that. Nobody wants to deal with those trucks, and so they're left well alone, and how easy is that? So there are ways that these, that these things are finding their... Uh, finding their way onto commercial airlines as well. And I do also think that there's some evidence that flight crews are becoming quite ill um, mm -hmm. from the things, the chemicals that they're encountering from flying through these things repeatedly. Yeah. yeah. So these sorts of pieces of evidence are, are beginning to manifest themselves. Mm -hmm. It's one way, certainly that's one way that, could hap that it could happen. Um, so yeah, so the, I was I've used that in the book, and I think that it's important that people understand how these things could happen because it's one of the main arguments that one hears when you're talking about. Yeah, same. Oh, oh, how could this possibly happen yeah. without anyone knowing? Well, let me tell you something. We live in a world that's very, very compartmentalized. Need to know. We need to know in everything. Everything is specialized. It's another uh, thrust of the book. How can one? not know what's going on well. Maybe somebody in Australia is giving uh, orders to the pilot in Nevada and they don't know why. And, mm. you know, and, and there are reasons that pilots think they're doing this as well. Um, there are certain scientists in the United States who are acting as um, spokesmen for what's become termed geoengineering. Yeah. A couple of years ago, it wasn't easy to talk about this, but I think that so many people, millions of people started talking about it, and so whoever's ultimately at the bottom of all of this probably decided that they had to get their side of the story out as well. And so there are some talking heads. Um, David Keith, I think, is the one that comes to mind, particularly. Um, we're talking about geoengineering now. And um, lost the train of my thought. You're gonna have to edit this. Yeah, no, it's okay, Ask but it's because questions. it's so many uh, mm -hmm. questions. But uh, let's go back to the infrastructure because mm -hmm. the pilots mm -hmm. should, should know the at least a little bit. Uh, right, this is an interesting phenomenon. Well, no, you can do it remotely. As, as far as I know, it can also be done remotely. So they don't need to know. They don't need to know what's going on, and they're flying forward, and things are. It's so elemental if you think about it. They're going this way, and the chemical's going that way. Yeah. They don't need to ever see it necessarily, unless they see it out in front of them in, yeah. in another airplane. Actually, there are videos that a pilot is filming outside mm -hmm. of his cockpit, and they see mm -hmm. that, and they're laughing about it because they don't know what it is. They either. They it get, is. getting used to it, and they see it every time, and they think maybe it's, it's normal, mm -hmm. and it's tra air traffic, and mm -hmm. whatever. Well, and it's also, I think, can boil down to something as simple as we have men and women who are flying our airplanes in the United States who are making the same amount of money that you make working for McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Okay, they really want to fly. This is their dream. This is their job. And it's not okay. a high-paid job anymore. Not a high-paying job anymore, and a lot of people want to fly. And, you know, sometimes I think it just boils down to job security. So people are right when they say, and when they say, well, how is it that no one knows about this? Well, lots of people know about this. The question is, are we talking about it yet? A lot of people are talking about it, which goes back to my um, presentation of the idea that the other side is now trying to make their case as well and give reason to well, that, you know what they are doing. So that's actually something that's come up in the last year and a half, two years. So that. In case anybody gets behind mm -hmm. it, they say, yeah, it's for the good of the world, it's against climate change and right. whatever. And there are some folks who are putting out, uh, you know, the fellows who do, why, are the why in the world are they spraying and how in the yeah. world? Those guys, yeah. yeah, they just put out a wonderful film in August. They kind of debunked everything that the other side has been putting out. Yeah. So there's, there are people all over the world uh, collecting data and proving that these things are wrong. There are also small little pieces of, uh, 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 in America of people taking a stand and just trying to get their local uh, 
government to forbid this. Yeah. You have to start somewhere, right? It doesn't make sense if it's for the good of a shield against the sun. They no. could do it over the deserts and not over populated mm -hmm. areas, but they're doing it mostly over pop populated areas and areas that uh, where they can use trade winds and things yeah. to spread. No, it doesn't make any sense. One of the things that does happen as well, I know David Keith is very uh, insistent on saying things like uh, the aluminum nanoparticles, uh, and Ken Caldera too, uh, reflect sun back up. But the reality is this will trap the heat yeah. overnight. They trap it overnight. And not only are they trapping all the chemicals in the heat overnight, but it's killing all the vegetation. So isn't that contrary to their, Absolutely. their postulated you know, purpose? Yeah. So. Absolutely. You don't know what the purpose actually is. Uh, do, do you have any idea what, well, why would anybody do it? Why would anybody do this? Yeah, that's the $60,000 question, isn't it? Why? My opinion after looking into this and talking to people as much as I have is that there really is a system in place. It's a system, I think, driven by greed generating money for just a few. Um, there was a time when obviously the military was interested in controlling the weather for military purposes and that was I think what started the phenomenon going. But it's it's gotten to the point now where um, we're in a situation where if you can control the weather and you can... Do you, do you remember when we used to trade commodities futures mm -hmm. where you would make a bet yeah. on the weather so, and how so long, yes. and whether the soy crop was going to fail and maybe you'd make some money insurance wise. Well, isn't it if you're going to be someone like that in your best interest to control what happens with the weather when you place your bet? Okay. There's a lot of that going on right now. In fact I think that's cool. everything everything that I'm saying right now is in the public arena. It's all in it's all out there, I'm not... But isn't that even a plan to reduce the population of mankind? They say that there is. Because of the they say uh, that Georgia there Georgia high is. stones and stuff, and even mm -hmm. They say that there is that sort of a plan, yes. I can't prove it, but it certainly looks that way, doesn't it? To reduce the size of the population. One of the things that's going on in the United States is, is um, physiologically... Uh, uh, Physiologically, a lot of um, diseases are skyrocketing mm. in the last 10 years. Uh, anything that has to do with the respiratory system, anything that has to do with your uh, immune system, there, are, there seem to be parts of the body that are being attacked, um, specific to, to the metals that are being dumped on us, most specifically to aluminum. Aluminum nanoparticles are being traced to things like Alzheimer's which has just skyrocketed in the last 10 years. Um, there's uh, some, a lot of scientific data that suggests that the aluminum nanoparticles actually combine with fluoride and accelerate what fluoride does. Aluminum is a, an accelerant, mm -hmm. okay? I know when I was writing the book, I found um, that the fires that are burning, the wilderness fires that are burning are burning in demonic ways, ways that no firefighter has ever seen. And in fact, things are going on like root systems well below the surface are burning, are on fire after fires have been put out because there, there's aluminum accelerant that's, I believe, reacting with oxygen or bringing oxygen into the roots. Anyway, these are things, these are things that we've never seen before. Have you heard about Morgulons? Yes, I have. Yeah. I have. I've had, um, this is Clifford Carnicon's yeah. area of expertise, and I do think that there is something in the book about that. Um, I was, uh, the book was a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to fictionalize and bring in composite characters and bring up uh, some of the phenomena that are happening, like Morgellons, um, and what people might or might not be doing about that. So, um, yes, I have heard of Morgellons. I have, uh, like I said, I've got children who are sick, and I believe sick very specifically to what they're breathing. Again, this is a, this is a situation where you, how can you look your children in the eye and not start talking about this when you know that they're inhaling tons and tons and tons of these, of these metals all the time? 
So yeah. they're not well. They're not well in the same ways that we were well right. as human beings yes. 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Right. You just have to look at them and see what's going on. They're just fall Children are falling apart physically. Yeah. And that has to come from somewhere. So. So when you finished your book, what yeah, happened? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have to tell you that wasn't the end of the. Uh, that wasn't the end of the line. There was a situation where. Um, very conveniently, a pin fell out of my steering column as I was driving. Yeah. Slight I mean, these, in your place. these, yes. Yeah. These things, these phenomena, these yeah. just kept happening as I was writing the book over and over and over again. Is there a smoking gun that goes back to those kinds of things? No. But isn't it interesting that these things were happening to me as I was writing this book? And in the end, yes, on March 31st, 2012, I did finish writing the book. I had my little, um, I don't know, what these things with the, USB stick. Yeah, 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 in my computer. Mm -hmm. In the afternoon and by midnight, my house was on fire. My house was burning down. My house burned to the ground the day I finished writing the book. Again, a very interesting coincidence. Absolutely. The only thing I went back into the house for during the fire was the book. Mm -hmm. If that fire was not a coincidence, that's probably not what they wanted me to do, but that's what I did. Yeah. And sure enough, the, uh, the book is out there now, and we're talking about it. So, here you have a, a period of a year and a half. You have a period of a year and a half that began with this ridiculous, ridiculous death mm -hmm. that made no sense whatsoever, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. A journey of learning about chemtrails and what's being done to us and all of the ways that that's infected humanity. Mm -hmm. It's killing, I mean, uh, the BBC, I think, even just put out a, uh, an article that there's so much stuff in our atmosphere that our, our um, sun has been dimmed by 20%. 20% in the last 10, 10 years, maybe? Yeah. Why do we still need to dim the sun, Joe, if it's already been dimmed 20%? Mm -hmm. None of this makes any sense whatsoever. It's the poorest sort of logic. Absolutely. And it has to all be put together for people to understand that. So we start there, and a year and a half later, we end with my house burning to the ground, but a completed book. Yeah. And that's why we're here, talking about that. That's so surprised that you do it and that you uh, talk about it. Are you not afraid? Mm -hmm. How do you sure. deal with, with the fear? <coughs> sure I am. I'm just more concerned that, uh, I'm more concerned about being able to look my children in the eye and tell them that, never let it be said that nothing was done, ever, that we didn't try. Mm -hmm. There's that. Um, and also, in the last year and a half to two years, the phenomenon that I was talking about before, everyone's talking about it. The scientists are trying to justify it, so they're talking about it constantly, and the more people talk about it, the safer it is to talk about it. There's nothing in my book that's not in the public domain and that everybody isn't talking about it. And I'm standing on the shoulders of giants anyway. I'm just, you know, someone that had this thing happen to me that I was able to put A, B, C all the way to Z together and put it, luckily, I'm a writer, and put it in a, in a book and put it out there. But I'm standing on the shoulders of people who really lost their, who lost their lives over this stuff, talking about this stuff, and Clifford Carnicom you know, all the guys that were making movies about this, mm -hmm. really brave stuff, right? Yeah. Getting on the radio and being threatened constantly mm -hmm. um, and living their lives that way. So yes, I'm scared and I have been scared. I'm actually not scared anymore because, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it really, there's a solution on the horizon, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I feel very strongly after having written this book that the one thing that we don't need to do is despair yeah. at this point. That's right. Uh, we are um, spiritual beings actually yes. incarnated in, in this body, in this world, this mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So um, That's one of the things, that was one of the biggest gifts of this book to me, was the idea that the, the very real idea that there's light, and there's dark. Yeah. And my sense is the light is always going to prevail. And when I looked around and I saw all of the things that are coming to light right now, I got the very real sense that there is a force in this existence 
that's pulling all the filth up into the light so that we can all, because the light will take care of it. The light will take care of it. So no, I, I, I don't, I have, I have more hope now after having written the book than I ever had before. Because what it is is evidence that we're taking care of it. It's, it's evidence Absolutely. that we're capable as who we are and as entities on this planet and that we're dealing with it. Okay, so everything is coming up anyway. You can see it everywhere here and we're in London. Sure a lot yes. of things are coming yes, you sure can. out here. It's hard to look at, but it's better that it's out. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the dark forces work with fear and mm -hmm. if you have, um, if you give in to fear mm -hmm. and you say, okay, I don't do anything, then they succeed. But mm -hmm. if you overcome fear and see what that light is mm -hmm. there and the stronger than the darkness, yes. then we can... It reveals everything as sort of smoke and mirrors, doesn't it? That's yeah. the name of their game, smoke and mirrors. And I say a handful of fear, really, is all it is. It's just a handful of fear. Blow it away. I'm very grateful that you wrote the book and that you talk about it and I think more people who see this should do, talk about what they experience and you say the pilots and there's maintenance crews and, um, it's working someone in the airport and they should come out and talk about it and they might at least lose a job but we all might lose our lives or right. our health right. if we don't stop this and uh, bring it out. Mm -hmm. And you are optimistic this is happening. Very. We've got, there's a Swedish politician. I wish I could tell you her name. That was very brave to come out and talk about it. There are politicians all over the United States that are allowing themselves to be interviewed in these films. Yes. Um, maintenance workers, pilots, just regular people. I'm just fortunate that I have a story that has a beginning, middle, and end yes. that you can follow yeah. along with. Yeah. Okay, I hope we could have this book in German. We are I looking so. for a publisher, but... Yeah, translators. But translators are welcome. Translators are needed. Okay. So long you have it in English, and we will translate this interview in German too, but it, of course it, uh, it's for the whole world, so... Right. Yeah. And one thing I would say, I would add, uh, if you are someone like yourself, or uh, I guess Naomi, who has a lot of data, on this subject, then talking about chemtrails is sort of like preaching to the choir. You know that saying? Yeah. So if you have people in your life who need to hear this, need this story, this is the kind of thing that they need to, they need to get a hold of. Rather than, I mean, a story that they can resonate with, something they can read with a beginning, middle, and end. Um, Might also make a good movie, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe that's all next, do that for me? next project. I don't know. <laughs> Movies is all I have had, big money, yeah. but that's a good story. That's not a story. It's important. It's vital. It's okay. I'm sorry. Story, I think, is a good word. <laughs> yeah, but small yeah. and stories is, is it's actually would make a good movie, right? Yeah. I'd like to see someone take that on. Wouldn't that be brave? It would, wouldn't it? Wouldn't so let's see what we can do, and I hope we, we can wake up more people with, with this interview mm -hmm. and, and uh, it spreads around the internet. And thank you. Thank you for thank what you're you. doing, and uh, good luck to you, and we meet each, uh, each other again yeah. someday. Good. Thank you, Para. Yeah. Good, thank you. Okay.